Good morning, good morning, good morning. Feels great to be in Roxbury. I walked on the Temple University's campus in the summer of 2000, ready to rep my neighborhood. In fact, I was wearing a BNBL t-shirt. That's the Boston Neighborhood Basketball League for the non-Bostonians in the room. And I can remember being in the cafeteria and this pretty brown girl walking up to me asking me where I was from. Proudly, I said, Boston. She looked at me and said, Boston? I didn't know there was black people in Boston. <laughs> this was shocking to me because everyone from my neighborhood, I said, well, what I said to her was, you, know, you don't know where Bobby Brown's from? She said, I didn't even know Bobby Brown was from Boston. You see, this is shocking to me because everybody from my neighborhood considers themselves to be the unofficial seventh member of the group. And in my eyes, New Edition, Bobby Brown, and BBD were doing for Boston what NWA did for Compton. I mean, the sense of pride we felt in seeing Roxbury's zone blow up was enormous. But the idea that black Boston was still unknown was a bit of a gut punch. Especially since I know there wasn't a radio station in America that didn't play Poison at least one time a day. But what I realized was that there was a disconnect between New Edition's music and the Orchard Park housing development that served as the group's genesis. So unless you were from Boston, you never connected or credit Black Boston for helping to create the soundtrack for the 1980s and 90s. You see, when Boston stories told, it's Dunkin' Donuts, it's that fake exaggerated accent of Park the Car, <laughs> it's Ben Affleck's character in the town that have come to personify what a Bostonian is supposed to look and sound like. So when my new friend Suge and her thick Philadelphia accent questioned if there was black people in Boston, it triggered me. At the time, it was anger, but as I got older, I was able to really articulate what I was feeling, and it was erasure. This idea that Boston's black experience, my experience, was unknown and invisible. And the question I kept coming back to was why? Why is black Boston's history and culture unknown? Unknown nationally, which is why questions persist around the mere existence of black people, but also invisible locally, which shows up in the way in which the city presents itself to the world. Heavy on the bowls of clam chowder, and not a single reference of Tapa Karu. You see, Brother Tapa is a writer, producer, Roxbury native, and one of the co-creators for the Martin television series. I'm sure a few of you have seen an episode or two. No? All right, I guess it's just me. <laughs> but this is the pattern. Black Boston influencing culture nationally and receiving no recognition locally. Look at Crispus Attucks. Black man born indigenous to this land, first person killed during the Boston Massacre, Barry just steps away from both City Hall and the State House, yet there's not a statue or a park commemorating this man's status as one of this country's founding fathers. Yet Christopher Columbus has had a statue in the North End for decades, has an avenue that runs right through the heart of Roxbury. I walked past the Christmas Attic School a thousand times as a kid. And it wasn't until I got to high school that I found out exactly who this black man was. Imagine the power and pride Boston's black boys and girls could have felt in knowing that America's first patriot looked like them. During the 17 and 1800 Boston's black community called Cops Hill in the North End home, later expanding to neighborhoods of Beacon Hill in the West End. This is the same time that Phyllis Willie became the first black person published within the 13 colonies. You see, most of my childhood friends attended the Phyllis Willie Middle School in Roxbury, yet none of us were really aware of who this black woman was. The school has since had a name change. It's now called Boston Day and Evening Academy. No connection to Phyllis Wheatley, and that history is now gone. Before the Civil War, Boston was the epicenter for the abolitionist movement. Abolitionists, their organizations, and blacks escaping enslavement in the American South found safe haven within, within black Boston. Before the, and during the Civil War, Frederick Douglass even recruited for soldiers at the, for the 54th Regiment right at the African Meeting House, right in Beacon Hill. I mean, there's a statue right there, but even in that statue, you got the white colonel in the front and the black soldiers relegated to the back. Nameless, faceless, lost to history. By the 1900s, Boston's black community was being pushed from the West End and Beacon Hill into the neighborhoods of Roxbury and South End. I mean, even though they moved geographically, their impact on the culture remained intact. Writers, musicians, 
activists, all called Boston home. Just think about it. Minister Louis Farrakhan grew up on Cabot Street right in Roxbury. The queen of 70s disco, Donna Summers, lived in Mission Hill, graduated at Burke. Boston was the home of the Renaissance before Harlem. Scholars called it that. Boston's black community really began to explode during World War II, making it one of the most diverse black communities in the nation. My family is a prime example of that. My maternal great-grandmother, Olivia Day, was born on Albion Street in Roxbury in 1898. Her husband, Antonio Gonzalez, immigrated to Boston from Cape Verde in 1903. But the remaining members of my family arrived to Boston in the 1940s by way of Jamaica, Georgia, Virginia, and Philadelphia. You see, what I realized was that telling black Boston's history would be in direct conflict with the narrative and perception that the city of Boston has created for itself, which is this white Irish bastion of liberalism. So instead of receiving the full history, you receive a whitewashed version of it, one that allows the city's most racist incidents not only to define it, but to define the black experience. And this gives us a perception that Boston has no black history or black culture, simply black victims. So stories of David Duke marching with the Klan in South Boston, Mr. Ted Landmark being stabbed with Old Glory in front of City Hall. Dyer Williams being shot on a football field in Charlestown. Or Charles Stewart murdering his wife, blaming a black man, and BPD's subsequent raid on Mission Hill have all come to define Boston's black experience. But even in spite of all this, I still love this city. But the Boston I love is far removed from the one that the media depicts. And I guarantee you facts, any black Bostonian in this room it has nothing to do with the Green Monster or, or Duck Boat or the, or the Freedom Trail and everything to do with the neighborhood in which you grew up in. You see, I love Boston because I love Roxbury. And my love affair with Roxbury started when I was a toddler. See my mother in the front row. And it started with my mother riding the elevated rails from Eggleston Station to Northampton Station to go to Cooper Community Center for daycare. It started in 1990, standing on Martin Luther King Boulevard with my little fist in the air as Nelson and Winnie Mandela rolled past. It was a large mango slushy from Malcolm X Park from the Icy Lady. It was growing up around the corner from the house that Malcolm X grew up in. It was reading his autobiography as he compared Humboldt Avenue to Sugar Hill in Harlem. It was my father telling me stories of attending Muhammad's university. It's my grandfather getting Muhammad Ali to sign one of my dad's drawings when he visited Boston. It was a kite festival, but when it was on the golf course. You know what I'm saying? That's different. It was Reggie Lewis handing out turkeys at the Roxbury Boys and Girls Club. You see, I love Boston because I love Roxbury. But this isn't a, hey, black people are here story. No, this ain't that. This is me setting the record straight. This is me saying that there is no Boston without black people. This is me saying that to the people who come here and move here, that we don't need you to come here and create culture or create history. Black Boston's culture has been living and thriving here for 300 plus years. This is me saying that we are no longer gonna wait for somebody else to tell our story. Black Boston got it from here. Thank you. <laughs>